For the next few moments, I want to take a look at the picture Paul paints of the person who is dominated by the energy of the flesh. That is, a person who is guided by the me in me. Evidently, Paul felt that his readers needed some help in determining just what the flesh looks like. So, in accomplishing that, he sets forth 15 ideas, if you want to count them. 15 ideas which can be placed in three major categories. So, first, Paul reveals that the person energized by the flesh is susceptible to sexual impropriety. That is, he or she is consumed by the physical, that everything gets back to that. Paul actually gives us three words in this category. The first word is immorality. The Greek word is actually pornea, which is the basis of our English word pornography. This particular word encompasses any kind of sexual intercourse that is beyond the bounds of God's will for, the, for physical relationships. It includes sexual activity between two married people who are not married to each other, as well as sexual activity between those who may be unmarried. Now, I think we should note that sexual intimacy is a wonderful gift from God. But sexual intimacy not guided by the Spirit is ultimately destructive. This has been proven time and time again through the demise of individuals, of families, of businesses, and even churches. Paul's second word in this category is impurity. This is a reference specifically to the sexual sins committed by men, in particular homosexuality. Paul's third word in this category is sensuality. This particular word refers to the obsessive sexual drive that sees no bounds, that feels no shame in sexual deviancy. In fact, this person manifests a prideful scorn for that which is decent and pure. This person would publicly deride those who teach any kind of self-control or restraint. I think that you would probably agree with me that it is not uncommon for the sexual drive to be the strongest of all the drives. In fact, the sexual drive can take over one's life and rule it as an invincible tyrant. This is not an element of our lives that is to be taken lightly. The person energized by the flesh, the me and me, is not only evidenced in sexual uh, impropriety, but also in spiritual misjudgment. Now, Paul uses two words here. The first word he uses is idolatry, which is the allegiance to any God other than Jehovah God. This includes hand-carved idols of Africa. This includes the mystic philosophies of the Far East. This includes the works-oriented religions of the Middle East. This includes the tenets of secular humanism. This includes the worship of money or power or intellectualism or any material thing that rules your life. It could be a car. It could be a boat. It could be property. It could be a home. 
It could be any one of a thousand different things that rules your life that has taken the place of God's importance and God's significance in your life. Now, the second word that Paul uses under this category of spiritual misjudgment is sorcery. The Greek word is pharmakia, which sounds a lot like our English word pharmacy, yes. It refers to the sorcerer's administration of drugs in controlling the mind. This word came to be used as a reference to any type of occultist activity and magical enchantment. In today's world, it would conclude things or it would include things like Ouija board, seances, tarot cards, palm reading, horoscopes, devil worship, drug addiction, channeling, yoga, as far as an Eastern type meditative exercise and transcendental meditation. Millions of people the world over are involved in these kinds of things that you see on the screen now. Well, why? Simple. The flesh, apart from God, longs for spiritual fulfillment. And unfortunately, in its quest for that fulfillment, the flesh will reach out for and accept many different kinds of pseudo-religious experiences, which of course is demonstrated by the success of so many isms today. I read a newspaper article that highlighted the growing metaphysical market in the United States. In this particular article, uh, they pointed to the increasing number of spas that are providing their customers with connections to the supernatural. At one such spa in the metropolitan area of Atlanta, according to the article, a patron can get a metaphysical add-on to any spa service, such as a $100 tarot card reading or a $175 per hour astrological consultation or for $200 an hour you can talk to an American Indian shaman at Post Ranch Inn in Big Sur, California. Now doesn't that just send chills up and down your spine? Other spas around the country offer guided tours through past lives. Polarity therapies which claim to align life energies and also dream therapy. All of these things are purportedly seen as paths to a deeper life. Yesterday during our staff meeting, we were talking about the meaning of the word spirituality. Because you, you saw all of the things that were listed moments ago that people are getting involved in. And so we begin to talk about the, the definition of spirituality. What does it mean when you use the word spirituality? What does it mean when a person who's in the tarot card says, I'm a very spiritual person? Well, what does it mean when a person who is glued to a Ouija board, hey, I'm a very spiritual person? Well, what does it mean when a person uh, is into transcendental meditation and they say, hey, I'm a very spiritual person? If someone asks you to define spirituality, how would you define it? The best definition I've ever heard is this. Spirituality is the way you take care of your soul. What a terrific definition. Well, of course, there are all kinds of spiritualities out there. 
But I, I think that there's no greater definition than that. And I think there is no better connection to that idea than that of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's how we take care of our soul. And some people use one of the kazillion different isms that are out there. And some people just say, you know what, if I go to church a time or two, that's how I'm going to take care of my soul. And somebody says, well, hey, if I listen to 91.5 FM, that's how I'm going to take care of my soul. And some people just ignore their souls altogether. But a spiritual person knows how to take care of their souls. So the person living in the energy of the flesh is susceptible not only to sexual impropriety and spiritual misjudgment, but the person living in the energy of the flesh is also susceptible to societal disruption. Now, a society could be as small as a circle of two. A society could be as small as a circle of several. Or a society could be a circle of thousands. Here at Countryside, we have a society of hundreds. Any society in the country, whoever may be in it, and for whatever reason it has arisen from a church perhaps like this one to a government entity to a city council to a school board to a classroom is prone to societal disruption. So, Paul lists no fewer than ten societal disruptions. He gave us three under the first category. He gave us two in the second. But when it comes to societal disruption, he lines out ten different characteristics of a life being controlled or highly influenced by the flesh. So what is the first such disruption? Paul uses the word enmities. Now this particular word refers to an inner defiance and hostility toward others. You've probably never known anybody like that. You've probably never been a person like that. But that is what enmity is. Uh, there is oftentimes enmity between teenage children and their parents. When you were a teenager, did you experience enmity toward your parents? Did they experience enmity toward you? This defiance, this hostility. When our oldest son, who, who was the perfect child, hit age 13, he became filled with enmities. He had a defiance. He had a hostility about him that was un unlike anything we, of course, had ever uh, encountered as parents. But he had it. The second word Paul uses is strife. This term depicts the, conten the contention, the fighting, the wrangling, and open discord that is produced by inner hostility. Look, you can't keep it in. It's going to come out. That's where strife comes along. And we find ourselves at odds verbally or even physically with the people around us. That is, that is the flesh. Next on Paul's descriptive list of societal disruption is jealousy. Jealousy can be defined as unfriendly feelings that are ex excited by another's possession of good. They've got something I don't have. Things go better for them than they go for me. They've got more money than I have. They have more of this than I have. They, they always have things. They always end up falling in, as we would say in South Georgia, they always end up falling in a cow patty but come up smelling like a rose. Jealousy is the petty dissatisfaction on the part of a person 
who sees himself or herself as inferior in some way to another person. And a person harboring jealousy can become quite zealous in his or her negative notions. Now following on the heels of jealousy, Paul lists outbursts of anger. This phrase refers to the sudden eruption of rage, the abrupt and lightning quick explosion of the emotions. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon instructs us to avoid quick-tempered people like the plague. Notice what he said. Do not associate with a man or woman given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. Fifth, Paul uses the word disputes as evidence that a person is controlled by the flesh. This word originally referred to a person who sought to be placed in political office by shady or unscrupulous methods. Now, we know nothing of that in America. But that's what the word means. It also, in the first century, referred to the hireling or day laborer who usually tried to cheat his employer. It, all, it ultimately came to picture anyone of selfish ambition who would attempt to advance themselves even if it meant creating, creating division between other people in order to get it done. Sixth, Paul says that dissensions give evidence of the dominating fleshly drive. This word literally means to cause to stand apart. The idea here is that of any activity which serves to disunite or divide people on a regular basis. Has anyone ever called you on the phone and said, you won't, you won't believe what so-and-so just said to me? Anybody ever called you? Have you ever called anyone and said, you won't believe what old so-and-so just said to me? And the purpose of the call is to divide. It is to get this third party on your side before the other party can get them on their side. That is called dissensions. And it happens Quite often, it can happen between husbands and wives. It, it can happen between husbands and wives in their extended family. Well, Joe, I called Mama today and told her what you did. <laughs> now, a word closely related to dissensions is the seventh disruptive action as set forth by Paul. He calls it factions. This term refers to the choosing of sides as the result of activities meant to divide one person from another. It is a, it is a dis destructive spirit that publicly sets one group against another. Have you, have you ever been a part of a church where that happened? Now I'm going to tell you something. If you've been a Baptist as long as I have, you have been part of a church where this happened. There were two distinct sides, and you better know which is the right side to be on. You choose the wrong side, and you're going to be out. Technically, this word suggests the separation of one group from, from another based upon some matter of theology with one group disregarding the true exposition of God's Word. We might sum this entire idea up as the us against them kind of mentality. The eighth disruption that Paul mentions here 
in verse 21 is translated envying. Now, unlike the concept of jealousy, have we got envying up there? Envying goes beyond unfriendly feelings to unfriendly actions. This term depicts behavior that is designed to deprive another person of what he or she has, even if it means using trickery, deceit, or force. Now, the last two disruptive actions on Paul's list are drunkenness and carousingness. Drunkenness refers to binges of excessive and uncontrolled drinking. Carousing refers to all night parties that often lead to orgies. Now you probably thought this kind of thing didn't happen until the 20th and the 21st centuries. But apparently even in Paul's day people had all night parties that led to orgies. Now, Paul's three-column list of sexual impropriety, spiritual misjudgment, and societal disruption is not to be inclusive. He said, and things like these. There are many things more that Paul could have talked about. His outline is but a sample of the behavior that commonly occurs in the life of the person who is dominated by the flesh. That is, the person who caves in to the me and me. Now, it's easy to spot the common thread running through each of Paul's terms. What do you think that thread is? What do you think it is? The self. It is the self. It is what self wants. It is what self likes. And in each category, self is lifted up to the detriment of everyone else and everything else. Now, according to verse 21, this is not the first time that Paul had spoken to the Galatians about the danger of surrendering to the influence of the me and me. Not only that, but Paul had warned them about the outcome of such surrender. Notice what he said in verse 21. I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now the idea is not the single commitment of any one of these acts that will doom a person to hell, but rather Paul is referring to the ongoing engagement of such actions. Notice in verse 21, the word translated practice. The grammatical construction contains the idea of lifestyle. If a person has given himself or herself over to these kinds of behaviors, and there's not even an attempt to overcome it, there is no shame about it. There is no guilt. There is no desire to win out and become a different kind of person. Then that is conclusive evidence that they are outside the kingdom. Somebody says, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Connell. Do you see here a conflict between the warning of Paul in verse 21 and the theme of his letter, which is faith plus nothing equals salvation? Of course, there is no conflict here. Paul understands that even a Christian may periodically stumble under the weight of the flesh. 
But the person who lives perennially in a fleshly free-for-all is demonstrating that he or she has never joined the world of the kingdom. The spirit of light does not reside in the life of the person who habitually displays characteristics of spiritual darkness. The key word is habitually. That's the idea of practice. Take note of Psalm 51 beginning with verse 10. David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. And sustain me with a willing spirit. Now David saw, penned Psalm 51 as a record of his repentance in the wake of a fleshly outburst. There had been a period of time in his life when the me in me dominated. During that period of time, David took another man's wife. He concocted a clever scheme to cover it up. And then when that didn't work, he conspired to kill the woman's husband. Now, you may not agree with this, but I want to suggest to you tonight that few people have blown it more than David. However, in the verses that we read moments ago, I want to give you insights that just might help you squash the foibles of the flesh. Here's number one. David did not lose his salvation. But what did he lose? He, he lost the joy of his salvation. Now let me share with you that Christians living in the flesh are not joyful people. At least they aren't joyful for very long. David did not have to become a child of God again. But his need was returning to a posture of fellowship with God. He did not lose his sonship. He lost his fellowship. I mean, the same thing was true when I had children. No matter what they did, they were my children. They had sonship or daughtership. But guess what? If they really messed it up, it didn't impact their last name, but it impacted their fellowship with their daddy. It impacted the fellowship with their mama. And things needed to be set right. It was never a question of whether or not those three children were ours. But oftentimes... It could be a matter of fellowship. So David did not lose his relationship with God as a result of all this garbage he got into. But he did lose his fellowship. He could not be joyful. He was a miserable person. Second, David knew... That he had a heart problem. He did not need another rule to keep outwardly. But he needed something inwardly to make him different. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know how you feel about the Second Amendment. I, I don't know how you feel about guns. And, and uh, I, have, I have my view, which is very much, very much pro-gun. Uh, and I have guns in my house, if you're thinking about breaking in. Just, just want to let you know I've got guns in my house. Donna knows how to use them. Amen. However, what people think is we need more laws. As if more laws 
are going to make people behave correctly with guns. David did not need more laws. He knew that his actions were wrong. He knew that his actions were sinful. He, he did not need to have more raw laws and rules placed on his life. Look, he couldn't keep the ones that were placed on his life. But there's something going on in his heart. And he became distracted because of something going on in his heart. And he came to the awareness that he had a heart problem. James says these things erupt from the inside. Now, now here's the third thing. David rehearsed the idea that practicing the presence of God and renewing himself to the Holy Spirit would make that difference inwardly. The key words are practicing and renewing. Now I think that brings us back to something we talked about last week. Present yourself to God. Present yourself to God. Present yourself to God. Present yourself to God. Begin your day with Him and go back to Him again and again all through the day. Be open to Him. Stay open to Him. Renew yourself to Him again and again and again. Talk to Him often and seek His guidance. Those are things that David had set to the side. Those are the things that David began to ignore. And he is now coming before God and saying, Lord, renew that spirit within me. Practicing your presence, talking to you, seeking your guidance, presenting myself to you. Job used the phrase, as a slave pants for the shade. The psalmist said, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. See, that, that's the idea. The passionate pursuit of one lover after another lover. So get that into our heads. We get that into our hearts. We get that into our lives as much as our necessary food. If you are living a life dominated by the flesh, I want to ask you one question. I want to tell you of one opportunity. And I want to make one suggestion. Here's the question. Are you happy? Your life is dominated by the flesh. Are you happy? We might say it another way. Are you satisfied? The answer, if you are a child of God and, you're, and the flesh has been dominating your life, the answer is probably no. Now the problem is not so much that you may be breaking the rules, but rather living disconnected from the God who created you. See, all the rules that are being broken are nothing more than the things you are using to try to fill the vacuum created by the absence of God in your life. I would suggest to you that drinking is trying to fill the absence of God. And ultimately it becomes alcoholism. And it doesn't work. I, I would suggest to you that debauchery is nothing more than trying to fill the absence of God. And we become convinced that we've, that, that we've got to fill this vacuum with something. I've got to feel good. It's not going to fill the vacuum in your heart. Only God can do that. Now, does that mean you always feel good? Does it? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm 67. I don't feel nearly as good as I felt 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Do, do you? But feeling good is not the point. Now, here's the opportunity. You can be forgiven. And you can change. A high school sophomore once asked me how much God could forgive. That is, could a person be so bad that God would refuse to forgive? I directed that teenager to 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verses 1 through 20. And I direct you there as well. We do not have the time to look it up and read it. But when you read that passage, you will discover that if God was willing to forgive Manasseh, who was one of the most wicked kings in the history of mankind, if God could, would forgive Manasseh, he is willing to forgive you. Get that question off the table. The only thing God will not forgive is a heart that is perpetually unresponsive to his offer of family membership. Now here's the suggestion. Start the turnaround with Jesus. His arms are open to you right now. He is waiting to enter your heart right now. So ask Him to come in. Don't wait, but do it now. Now in just a few moments, we're going to conclude. If you would like to talk about accepting Jesus Christ into your life and all of the forgiveness that comes with it, I, I'm going to be right over here for a few minutes. I, I want you to come and talk to me. If you would like to talk about joining this church, come right over here to my right and talk with me. If you are one of our guests and you have not yet exchanged some information with us, I invite you to come over to my right, to your left. I want to give you a $10 gift card to Chick-fil-A just for exchanging a little bit of information with us. As I always say, we will not sell it. We will not misuse it. We will not even contact you unless you say that we can. But we want to offer that to you as a way of expressing our appreciation and just connecting a little bit. So we're going to pray. In eight minutes after that, we're going to pray. Uh, we're going to pray together. I'm going to lead you in prayer. And then in eight minutes, we'll begin our corporate prayer time. I hope you'll join us. Father, we are so grateful that you are here among us tonight. We need you so much more than we could ever understand, more than we could ever express. You know that. And perhaps there are men and women in this place tonight, all of us, Lord, who have so much from one, in one time or another struggled with the me and me, with the foibles of the flesh, with the power of the flesh. And Lord, we are so grateful that you not only can, but you will forgive anything when we stumble and fall. The only thing that cannot be forgiven is a pride in living according to the flesh that keeps us from coming to you for the answers. Thank you for the power of your word. Use it magnificently in our lives as we go forth tomorrow and may people see in us men and women who practice not the deeds of the flesh, but who practice the presence of God. It is in His name that we pray.